According to Ibn Jizay al-Kalbi, one of the major themes or forms of composition found in the Qur'an is the hereafter. In particular, the Qur'an often describes the last day, al-yawm al-akhir. This expression is also found in the New Testament. The Johannan Jesus often speaks of certain events happening en te eskate hemera, on the last day. Therefore, the study of last things, or eschatology, is a branch of theology that deals with death, also known as the lesser hour, as sa'atu sughra, the signs of the last day, amaratu sa'a, the last day itself, also known as the day of judgment, or the greater hour, as sa'atu kubra, and finally, paradise and the fire, the ultimate destinations of human beings. With respect to our death, or the lesser hour, the proof of Islam, Imam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, rahmatullah offered this powerful and poignant statement in his famous Ihya ulum al-Din. Praise be to God, who with death did break the necks of tyrants, shattering with it the backs of Persia's kings, cutting short the aspirations of the Caesars, whose hearts were long averse to recalling death, until the true promise came to them and cast them into the pit. From the loftiest of palaces to the deepest of graves they passed, and from the light of the cradle to the gloom of the sepulchre, from dallying with maidens and boys into sustaining insects and worms they passed, from reveling in food and drink into wallowing in the earth, from the friendliness of company into the forlornness of solitude, and from the soft couch into the woeful perdition. See if they had found any strength and protection from death, or taken against it a barrier and refuge. See the verse, هَلْ تُحِسُّ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ أَوْ تَسْمَعُ لَهُمْ رِكْزَ Do you perceive even one of them, or hear from them so much as a whisper? Imam al-Ghazari, Book 40, Kitab Dhikr al-Mawt Speaking of the hour, as in the hour of our judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, إِنَّ السَّاعَةَ لَآتِيَةٌ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, the hour is coming. There is no doubt about it. However, most of the people do not believe. As Muslims, we have confidence in ultimate accountability, that we will all stand judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the all-knowing, the all-wise, and all-just sovereign Lord of the universe. Our belief in the day of judgment is based upon clear statements in our sacred texts. It is according to the Sam'iyat, sacred tradition transmitted to us that describes supra-rational events. And indeed, I would argue that belief in a day of judgment is rational. Human beings constantly seek to establish justice in the world. Injustice is repugnant to us. This desire seems to be somehow innate, inherent, in part of our collective conscience as a species. We establish courts and judges and witnesses. Establishing courts of justice is one of the seven Noahidic laws. These are laws that strike the human intellect as being self-evidently true, axiomatically correct. Does anyone really believe that rapists and murderers and oppressors, who were never brought to justice in this world, simply get away with it? An atheist once told me that people will always get what they deserve. Like karma, I inquired. He said, yes, like karma. I replied, I thought you were a materialist. Karma is a sophisticated metaphysical process. Who is regulating and controlling that process? There was no rejoinder. Sometimes it is difficult for people to come to grips with the logical conclusion of their worldview. If we take materialistic atheism to its logical conclusion, then it is impossible to be objectively immoral. In other words, there can be no true right or wrong. On atheism, we are just random fizzing molecules and stardust. Imagine a stone rolling down a hill. The stone strikes the earth as it bounces, just atoms colliding with atoms. Now imagine a man pulling a trigger and firing a bullet into another man. Again, just atoms colliding with atoms. On atheism, there is no real difference between what the stone did and what the man did with the gun. What makes one set of atoms moral and the other set of atoms immoral? The answer is nothing. On atheism, murder is simply a breach of a subjective societal norm, 
It cannot be objectively wrong because there is no higher standard of morality and there's nothing beyond the physical. Nothing and no one is watching us or taking an account of our actions. Apparently, we are just a bunch of carbon-based primates living on some backwater planet on the edge of some random solar system. As Richard Dawkins famously said, there is, quote, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, end quote. Now, Dawkins and the rest of his neo-atheist ilk imagined that without religion, the world would be a much better place. But consider the following thought experiment offered by the modern philosopher David Berlinski, whose book The Devil's Delusion directly confronts Dawkins' The God Delusion. Imagine that there was a magic button. If someone were to press this button, mountains of gold would magically come into his possession. However, there's a catch. One human being somewhere in the world would fall down dead. You don't know who or where. So here's the question. To whom would you entrust this button? To an atheist who doesn't believe in ultimate accountability? Who doesn't affirm that there's any authority above that of human beings? Who says that there's no law above human invention? Who contends confidently that there's no such thing as evil? Or would you entrust it to a theist who believes in God? A theist who affirms ultimate accountability? A theist who says, Inni akhafu in aseitu rabbi adhaba yawmin azim. I truly fear, if I were to disobey my Lord, the torment of a tremendous day. Which worldview makes for a more prosperous, peaceful, and just society? I think the answer is obvious. In the Quran, sometimes the rationale for a certain commandment is mentioned explicitly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. Indeed, the prayer prevents one from indecency and wrong action. If you have to pray five times a day at different times with wudu, engaging in fahsha and munkar become very, very difficult. Imam al-Qurtubi and Imam al-Zamakhshari mention in their tafasir that the Prophet wasallam said of a young man who prayed but was inclined towards indecent acts, soon his prayer will prevent him from doing that. The prayer you see is time-tested, but we have to be patient and constant. The prayer comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we must trust the process. It works. The worst thing we can do is leave the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bain al-kufri wal-iman tarku salah Between disbelief and belief is leaving the prayer. Or we might say, leaving the prayer takes one from a state of confidence to a state of ingratitude. Tarku salah, or abandoning the prayer, is also a major sign of the hour, according to Sayyidina Ali karamallahu wajhah. Another major sign of the hour, not unrelated to abandoning the prayer, is the coming of the imposter messiah or antichrist. The belief in the coming of the imposter messiah is an important aspect of Islamic eschatology that is often unfortunately neglected. The Prophet ﷺ warned us about his emergence due to the Prophet's profound concern for the well-being of his nation. The Prophet is, in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Harisun alaykum bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim, deeply concerned about you, kind and merciful to the believers. We read in the hadith, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min adabi jahannam wa adabi al qabr wal masih al dajjal. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of hell, the punishments of the grave, and from the imposter Messiah. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ is free from these things, protected from these things. But he is teaching us by example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا There is for you in the Messenger of God a beautiful example of conduct. He is the great teacher. He said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ مُعَلِّمًا I was only sent as a teacher. The Prophet is even reported to have said, the imposter Messiah will not appear until the people become negligent in talking about him and until the preachers on the pulpits stop mentioning him. In an extraordinary hadith recorded in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said, Man sami Let him who hears of the imposter Messiah keep a distance from him. 
For I swear by Allah that a man will come to him thinking he's a firm believer and end up following him because of confused ideas, because of heretical matters, shubuhat, roused in him by the imposter messiah. The imposter messiah, and not just the actual physical person, but the culture, the system, the zeitgeist of the imposter messiah raises shubuhat in the religion. In other words, people who identify as Muslim will eventually leave Islam and follow the imposter messiah because the imposter messiah will confuse them and cause them to doubt their religion. The imposter messiah will raise suspicions concerning normative, that is to say, traditional Islam in light of the current zeitgeist. He will attempt to redefine Islam. And we know that if words lose their definitions, then they can mean whatever we want, whatever makes us feel good. This is happening right now on a massive scale. Even words like man, woman, marriage, family, even beauty and virtue are becoming more and more difficult to define. One of the ways in which we can protect ourselves from the anti-Christic influence is to establish the prayer. Again, the worst thing we can do during these times is to abandon the prayer. Abandoning the prayer leaves us wide open for attack. Let us not render ourselves low-hanging fruit for the culture of the imposter messiah, a culture which advocates a myopic worldview, a worldview in which the world is all there is, a worldview where the only thing that matters is matter, a materialistic and hedonistic worldview of absolute autonomy that is complete self-rule, something that looks like paradise, but in reality leads to the fire. The Prophet ﷺ said, يَأْتِ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ أَصَّابِدُ فِيهِمْ عَلَى دِينِهِ كَالْقَابِتِ عَلَى الْجَمَرِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. There shall come a time upon the people in which the one who is patient upon his religion will be like the one clutching onto a burning ember, one could argue that this is certainly true in today's world. Many people of traditional religious practice and belief, the youth in particular, feel tremendous pressure to capitulate to the status quo of society, this liberal world order, in order to mitigate internal feelings of alienation. However, we should remember that as believers, we are not meant to feel all that comfortable in this world. At dunya sijnul mu'min, the world is the prison of the believer. This discomfort is completely normal. Our real comfort is in the next world. The Prophet said, Glad tidings to the strange ones. I often find myself repeating the following ayat from the Quran. It gives me solace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet وسلم, and by extension to all of us, Indeed, we know that what they say causes your heart to be constricted. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ But glorify the praise of your Lord and be of those who prostrate. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ And worship your Lord until certitude comes to you. In almost all of the exegesis of the Qur'an, say here that الْيَقِينَ means death. Worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a lifelong practice of a believer. So I mentioned the imposter Messiah, but what about the true Messiah? What is his role in Islamic eschatology? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about our master Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, وَإِنَّهُ لِعِلْمُ لِسَّاعَةِ فَلَا تَمْتَرُنَّ بِهَا وَاتَّبِعُونِي هَذَا سِرَاتُ مُسْتَقِيمِ And indeed, he, Isa alayhi salam, is a portent or sign of the hour. So never be in doubt about it and follow me. This is a straight path. Many exegetes of the Qur'an, including Imams al-Tabari, al-Qurtubi, and Ibn Kathir, mention that this verse indicates the rujur, or parousia, that is, the return of the Messiah, Jesus, peace be upon him, to the earth toward the end of time. This is in line with many sound ahadith in which the Prophet ﷺ spoke explicitly about the return of Jesus. To the surprise of many Christians, Muslims actually believe in the second coming of Christ. The quote-unquote Muslim Messiah is not the Mahdi. This is a common piece of misinformation that some Christian polemicists seem to insist on advancing. The Mahdi is the guided one from the progeny of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who will be a leader of the believers at the end of time. But Jesus, the son of Mary, is Al-Masih, the Messiah. The Quran says this explicitly. And Jesus, peace be upon him, will vanquish the imposter Messiah. 
Furthermore, the Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to our master Musa alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Innani ana Allah, la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim salata li dhikri. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God save me. So worship me and establish the prayer for my remembrance. Interestingly, just as a side note, the pronoun ana, meaning I am, is repeated here by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he introduces himself to Musa alayhi salam. This subtlety in the text is also found in the Torah. The verb ehye, meaning I am, is repeated by Hashem when he introduces himself to Moshe in Exodus 3.14. Ehye, ashar ehye, I am who I am. The purpose of this repetition seems to be to stress the core attribute of God, existence, that God is the necessary and non-contingent existent, the very ground of being itself. So after introducing himself to Musa alayhi salam as the only God and commanding Moses to worship him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands Moses not simply to pray, but to establish the prayer, to make prayer the pillar of his life. Such is the importance of the canonical prayers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Moses, peace be upon him, saying, Inna sa'ata atiyatun. Indeed, the hour is coming. I almost conceal it entirely, that every soul shall be requited for what it strove. No one knows exactly when the sa'a, the greater hour, will be established. There are only portents. The exact date is a secret that resides with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا they ask you concerning the hour, when will it be established? Say knowledge of this lies only with my Lord. There is also the famous hadith of the man who questioned the Prophet ﷺ saying, When is the hour? The Prophet responded with a better question. And what have you prepared for it? The man said, La shay'a illa anni uhibbu Allahu rasulah. Nothing except that I love Allah and His Messenger. The Prophet responded, Anta ma'aman ahbabt. You will be with those whom you love. Then Anas, radiallahu anhu, who narrated the hadith, he said, Fama farihna, Fama farihna bi shay'in farahana bi qawlin nabi sallallahu alayhi sallam, Anta ma'aman ahbabt. Nothing made us more joyous than the statement of the Prophet, You will be with those whom you love. Of course, there is also the famous hadith of Gabriel, when Gabriel, peace be upon him, asked the Prophet to inform him about the hour. The Prophet responded, Man mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min sa'il. The one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. In the earliest New Testament gospel, the Gospel of Mark, even the Mark in Jesus, who most Christians believe to be God, admits that even he does not know the hour. The Mark in Jesus says, Peri de tes hemeras ekenes kai tes horas. But concerning that day and the hour, u des oiden, nobody knows. U de hoi angoloi, hoi en urano, not even the angels in heaven. U de ha huias, nor the son, e me ha pater, but only the father, only Rabbul Alameen, Mark 13 32. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the final prophet of God. He is the first major sign of the greater hour. He وسلم, once said while holding up two fingers together, Ana wasa'a kahatain. The hour and I are like this. That was 1400 years ago, but still a drop in the ocean of time, relatively speaking. In the Gospels, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is reported to have given a few signs or portents of the hour. He said, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of the sorrows. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. And you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. Mark chapter 13, and there are parallel passages in Matthew and Luke. It is in the Islamic prophetic eschatological tradition, however, where we find some truly astonishing predictions 
attributed to our master Muhammad wasallam. If we return to the hadith of Gabriel, we see that Gabriel continued to question the Prophet wasallam. After asking the Prophet about the hour, Gabriel said, Tell me about the amarat of the hour, that is, the signs of the hour. The Prophet responded, And talid al amatu rabbataha, the slave girl will beget her mistress. Of course, there are many ways in which one may interpret this hadith. The Prophet was gifted with jawami al kalim wa jawahir al hikam, speech comprehensive in signification and inundated with sapience. The most obvious meaning is that children will disobey and disrespect their parents. A second interpretation states that due to numerous end time wars and conflicts, many slaves will be taken and they will have children. These children would be free and thus be masters over their own mothers. A third interpretation offered by modern scholars is that the Prophet's statement indicates a complete breakdown of normal society, the utter dismantling of millennia old social orders in societal hierarchies. This is a phenomenon that is happening before our very eyes. Self-entitled cultural zealots shaking their fists at thousands of years of human civilization and traditional scholarship and attempting to construct a radically egalitarian utopia in this world by any means necessary. In other hadith of varying grades, the Prophet also spoke of the prevalence of massive violence and sudden death the prevalence of sexual degeneracy leading to unprecedented epidemics. He said that women will walk around in public, naked, yet clothed. He spoke of a time when men will marry other men, when fornication will be in public, and when illegitimate children will wreak havoc. He said people will be suffocated by usury. He said music will be heard everywhere, and all kinds of alcohol will become prevalent. He said time will become short. Sacred knowledge will be withdrawn. Temptations will emerge, extreme avarice will descend, and haraj will prevail. The companions asked, what is haraj? He said, utter brutality and bloodshed. I leave you with this. The Prophet ﷺ advised us as to how to protect ourselves from the imposter Messiah and his culture. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu reported in the hadith is in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man hafidha ashara ayatin min awwali surat al-kahf Usima min al-Dajjal. Whoever memorizes the first ten verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be protected against the imposter Messiah. He also reported, and this hadith is in Tirmidhi, Man qara'a thalatha ayatin min awwal al-Kahf Usima min fitnat al-Dajjal. Whoever reads three ayat from the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf will be protected against the tribulations of the imposter Messiah. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, In yakhruj wa ana fikum, if the imposter Messiah emerges and I am among you, then I will contend with him on your behalf. But if he emerges and I am not among you, then every person must contend for himself. But there's another way to translate this. If the imposter Messiah emerges and I am in you, then I will contend with him on your behalf. One of my teachers said fikum could also mean that we have internalized the love of the Prophet in our hearts, the reverence of the Prophet in our hearts, the beauty and majesty of the Prophet in our hearts, the teachings and sunnah of the Prophet in our hearts. If he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is hayyun fi qulubina, alive in our hearts, then indeed the Prophet is contending on our behalf. Wallahu musta'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, protect us, and accept our efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take our souls while confidence in Him and in His Messenger remain in our hearts. And may He cause us to inherit the gardens of paradise.